Amen. A uh, wonderful message behind that song, the fact that we can come uh, as we are. We, we don't have to clean ourselves up, so to speak. Uh, we couldn't. If, if we were waiting and waiting till we were worthy to come to Christ, none of us uh, would be here. And so wonderful. Thank you for that special. Thank you, uh, Brother Stan, for powering through that. Uh, I would ask everybody to pray for him, not necessarily that his voice gets better, but I'm a little bit worried about him because if you all notice, he threw his wife under the bus. Uh, he got up and said, it's her fault. She wanted them trees cut, so uh, I'm, I'm concerned for you. you got a long drive home. Uh, but th thank you for that. Thank you for the special. So let's celebrate a little bit. I went around and around this week trying to figure out, I decided, you know what, Let, let's go back. If you remember back in late October, early November, we were looking at missionary Baptist distinctives, things that we believe. We looked at closed communion. Uh, we looked at why we don't recognize alien baptism. We looked at what a New Testament church was, things like that. And I, I was having a good time kind of going through our doctrinal stuff, kind of what we believe. Uh, because I think a lot of times in our world we don't focus on that. And I know preachers that claim, oh, I don't preach doctrine. And then I wonder what they preach because the Bible, the whole scripture is doctrine, you know, for man's benefit and teaching. So I, I have no clue. And so I thought, well, let's go back to that. And look at a few more of these things, maybe the next few weeks, kind of what we uh, believe and what we stand uh, behind. And so that's kind of where we'll be turning to Romans chapter 10. We are going to start there. And Romans 10 through a, uh, starting with verse 8. We will, be, we will be there, but today we are going to continue things that we uh, believe, continuing and looking at. And I'd intended to do that and just kind of keep rolling with that. And then I got to Thanksgiving and started preaching about being thankful. And you can't skip Christmas. Uh, I wanted to preach about Christmas and Jesus Christ and his birth and how that leads. And so now we're going to pick up for the next few weeks. I don't know how long. Uh, every time that I plan something out, uh, something changes. It, it never fails. The last time that I planned out, I planned out like two months worth of sermons. And then COVID hit, and they all just went, bloop, bloop, jumbled them all up. So I don't know. We'll see how long this works. But uh, we're going to start in Romans chapter 10, starting with verse 8. So if you want to stand for the reading of God's word, you can. So Romans 10, starting with verse 8, we all know these verses, says, But what saith that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day and this time to come, to be in your house, to be with your people, to read your word. And Father, we just praise you for allowing us to be here. We praise you for your grace and mercy. We praise you for Jesus Christ. We praise you for the cross. We praise you for the empty tomb. We praise you that it's free, that our salvation is free, that it's solely based upon what Jesus did and is based upon our faith in him. Father, we praise you that anyone can come and believe and that you will save anybody, Father. As it says, whosoever, Lord. We, we just thank you, Lord, that we cannot earn it or we can't deserve it. But you love us anyway. You forgave us anyway. Christ died for us anyway. And we would believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And we call upon his name, Lord, that we are saved at that moment. Father, we praise you for that. Lord, we pray for all those that have been mentioned today on the prayer list, those that are sick, those families who've lost loved ones, uh, those who are not here. Father, we just turn all requests, all, all prayers over to you, putting our faith and our trust in you, Lord. We pray for this country, Father, that, that we, we see things. And, Lord, we just we understand and realize that it's just one step, one day, one second closer to Jesus Christ coming back. And, Father, we focus on that, that no one can take our salvation. No one will ever defeat Jesus. And no matter what happens, we know you're in control. We know that Christ is king, and we know that we cannot be hurt because of that. Father, we just praise you. We love you. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 
All right, you may be seated. You may be thinking, what is he talking about? Well, we're looking at, and I'm not strictly going through like our doctrinal statement. That would be a wonderful Wednesday night class sometimes. I'm kind of just popping around. But if this was a doctrinal statement, it is doctrinal statement 15, which just simply states that we believe that all, and I think they should have capitalized that word, but all who trust in Jesus Christ for salvation are eternally secure in him and shall not perish. And there's a big, you know, when the doctrinal statements were come out, they were putting things in writing because there is no, like, official ABA association, technically, except four days a year when we meet in conference. We don't have a hierarchy. Uh, we do have a missions office, which is there for simply paperwork to transfer money uh, between missions. That's simply it. We don't have a leader. We don't have a command. We don't have a hierarchy. We don't. We're, we're independent Baptist churches because we govern ourselves. Uh, but when we do come together, the doctrinal statements was kind of put there to give us a semblance and understanding of what we believe. And the reason this was put there is because there's a heresy out there that you probably heard. It's technically uh, they they named it after John Calvin. I'm sure it was there before he came around. But it's called Calvinism. It's predestination. The idea being uh, that you're born. God either saves you, or you don't. And there's nothing you can do about it, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, can you imagine, and I would hate to have to be a Calvinist preacher. One, I wouldn't do it because it's a heresy. But let's say it was true. That would be so depressing to stand up to a group of people and be like, well, some of y'all may be saved. Some of y'all may not be. There's nothing you can do about it. Pass the plate. You know, how, what, what do you preach there? I mean, you can't preach repentance. You can't preach faithfulness. I mean, can you imagine going up to somebody and they're like, oh, I want to be saved. And you're like, well, flip a coin. <laughs> you know, how do you, but it actually has pervaded or invaded or whatever a lot of times into our Baptist uh, teachings. I went to a church one time and 15 people in that church uh, were Calvinist. And I didn't know it until later. I was told that after they left, after we left. So I was invited back and guess what I preached? I preached why they were wrong, right to their face. And, and I actually had a guy come out and shake my hand. He's like, I didn't agree with nothing you said, but I respect you for saying it. <laughs> That's better than, you know, half my family thinks. So anyway, uh, there's this purveying idea that, that you have no choice in that. Now I will say that do we, we don't, uh, we, we can't earn salvation. Jesus paid it all. But it is offered, and that's what we're looking at today, the fact that it is offered to everyone, not just the chosen select few. And you say, well, how, how do they get these? Now, we're going to be turned back to Romans 8, which is probably just a page or two. I'm going to look at the verses briefly uh, that they get these, this idea from. And with most heresies, uh, it comes from the Bible, actually, because people take a verse, and they don't understand what it's saying. They take it out of context. The four, when you're studying the Bible, we need to understand a few things. One, who is saying it? Because I can go to a Bible verse where Satan is speaking, and if I tried to make a doctrinal statement on that, that'd be crazy. Well, it's from the Bible, yeah. But Satan said it. So you need to know who is speaking, and then you need to know who they're talking to, who the audience is most misunderstandings in the Bible come because somebody takes a Bible verse and they look, they apply it to everyone and they don't realize that Jesus is talking to his church or the book of Hebrews is written to saved individuals about why the law is no longer in effect and why grace and Jesus is better than the law. Or in the case of Romans and Ephesians and Galatians and Philippians are wrote to the churches at Rome, Galatia, Ephesus. Uh, places like that. So we need to know who's talking. We need to know who they're saying it to. There's also things like we need to know what they're saying and why they're saying it. Contextual clues uh, to make sure that what we're, what we're doing is right. And so they, Calvinists who teach this take a couple of verses. And first one is Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and verse 30. And I will admit, reading them quickly uh, is not the best thing. And so I can't spend a whole lot of time because I want to celebrate the whosoevers. Uh, so, so you may want to ask me questions later. But looking at Romans chapter 8, 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Uh, Paul writing, now they, they take predestination, and the ideal is, when you're born, you have no choice. You're either saved or you're not saved. There's nothing you can do. God chose the chosen, right? And if you read those verses, it sounds kind of true. If you go back to 
chapter 29, uh, for whom he did foreknow. Who did God foreknow, though? Before the world was created, who did God know was going to be created? Everyone. Because we have an omniscient Lord who knew 6,000 years ago when he created the world, not science, not Big Bang, not accident, God created the world. But when he created it, he knew that 6,000 years later we would be standing in this building and we'd be doing what we're doing. He knew that. He knew everybody that's ever been born, ever will be born. And I will say that God does know when we are born who will be saved. Now there's a distinctive difference. He knows everything. So when, when you know, Tim was born, he knew that Tim would either be saved or not, but he didn't force you to be. There's a difference there. It's not born. He's like, Brother Stan's born, but you know what? There's no way I'm saving him. How heartbreaking would that be, by the way? Can you imagine being a faithful believer of God, studying your word, praying, and get there and God goes, Nope, I didn't pick you. So heartbreaking. I can't imagine so there is a difference there. When we're born, he knows what decisions we will make, whether we choose him or not, but he doesn't force us into that. We have free will to make those decisions. And I recognize that that is, you know, people get confused about that. I do believe that God is in control of most things. Uh, and there's this big debate. If you go on Facebook, and I'm fixing to delete Facebook, so you may, you know, just consider about that. I hate this. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're going into that, and there's, there's a lot of people are debating about can we die uh, when we choose to, things like that. And they're like suicides, and there's this big debate. And I do believe that if God does not want me to die, I won't die. And everybody's going, what about suicide? Have you ever heard about suicides that failed? The rope snapped. The gun didn't go off. They took so many pills, they vomited back up. There's failed suicides all the time. You say, well, now you're being horrible because what if somebody did kill themselves and God allowed it? I'm not God. I can't explain why he would do that. I can't explain why he allows car accidents to happen and people, you know, innocent teenagers and stuff die. I, I can't get into that. But I fully believe that if we are uh, under the protection of God, that I don't believe he's going to allow us to die until he chooses to. Now, can we shorten our life? If you go out and you live against the will of God, then, yeah, I think you can shorten it, but he knew before that you would shorten it. And if you obey him, you can lengthen it. But basically, if there's this burning fire in front of us, and I feel like God needs me to run in and help save a child, he's going to protect me. I do believe there's a protection there. I don't think I'm going to die until God says, fine, get it over with. A lot of people think. A lot of people think you control your own. You know, I don't know, but I don't. I think that I can face down a firing squad, and if God doesn't want me to die, every one of them will be a blank. It is what it is. But going back to predestination, I don't know how I got on that rabbit. Going back to predestination and this and that. Uh, going back to that, they read this and look at Romans 29 again. So he already foreknew everyone. He said those that he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. I believe, and when he's talking about that predestination, God does desire that every man or woman that's been born should come to the knowledge of his son Jesus and then should conform to the image of Christ. That is his desire. We know from other verses that said God uh, desires that all men, you know, he's patient, he's forgiving, he desires that. If you look at 30, it says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. Who does he call? Everyone. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he glorified. God does desire that all men would repent and come to repentance, and those who are saved should be conformed to the image of Christ. And so he does, he does desire from the beginning of time, before creation, God knew that Jesus Christ would go to the cross. God knew that he would die on the cross. God knew that he would come out of the grave three days later. God knew that that would offer uh, salvation to all mankind. And then God knows that all mankind has that free will to choose him. It's all been predestinated 6,000 years ago, probably millions of years ago because God's infinite. But he didn't create the world till 6,000 years years ago. And so he did predestinate that all men would have that choice. All people get a choice. The other verses they go to is Ephesians chapter 1. So if you want to flip over there. Ephesians chapter 1. And there's two of them here. Ephesians chapter 1. 
looking at verse 5. And remember, he's writing to saved people at the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestined unto us the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together into one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What Paul is talking about, and I realize Paul is wordy, Paul is a doctor, Paul, you think it's hard to read in English? Read it in Greek. He'll start a sentence that's like 19,000 words, and he'll make these two parts go together, and then he'll skip down here, and then go back here and it's like riding a roller coaster trying to follow him. The dude was a genius and our English translators actually done a good job of trying to make it somewhat semblance for our for our heads. And so you see that and you read that and what it's talking about Paul is talking to save people telling them that before the world was created God had already come up with a plan for them to have salvation, for them to get saved, for them to change, for them to grow, for them to be justified and for them to have an inheritance in heaven that we're looking forward to. And so, yeah, predestination biblically is true if you believe that we are all predestined to have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. We're all predestined with the same free will, the same opportunity, the same chance to come to know Christ, to come to be his people, and to, and to put ourselves forward. And so you see that, and they take these two verses and, pre and they try to prove uh, that you don't have a choice now let's look at a few verses that show we do have a choice. And this is where we get the whosoevers. I've said for years, and no one's ever done it yet, that we should all make shirts that say, I'm a whosoever. I know that they probably sell those on Amazon, but I wouldn't buy from Amazon for nothing, but that's another story. But, but you look at it, I'm a whosoever, because each and every one of us is a whosoever, and praise God for that. Now, we don't have time to go through all the whosoevers, but I'm just going to look at a few verses that prove anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and accepts Him as their Savior can be saved. God predestined the way, God predestined the door, and God predestined the opportunity, but He doesn't force you to do it, and He doesn't reject you uh, if you do, uh, do. And one funny, one other little thing about it's kind of strange. I've never met a Calvinist that actually thought they were one that was rejected. You're like, oh, I think you're born either saved or not saved. You're like, well, are, oh yeah, I am. I've never met one that said, nope, God turned me down, and I have no hope. You know, they're always, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a heresy. And so let's look at a few verses that prove how wonderful and merciful and graceful our God really is. Easy verse, easy. turn to Titus chapter 2 to kind of kickstart this. That was the introduction. <laughs> Sorry about that. Titus chapter 2. Looking at verse 11, and everybody, you know, I need to quit saying that. A lot of times I say everybody knows these verses. Everybody may not know these verses. Titus chapter 2, looking at verse 11, and this is a good one. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to a select few. No, hold on. Hold on. Let me, let me make sure his light's shining. All right, try again. Verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. How do you read that incorrectly? It literally says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I don't know how you misread that. I don't know how you take that out of context. Everyone, and that man means man, woman, women, child. You know, there's only two genders, man and women. That means everyone will have the opportunity, the grace of God that will bring salvation will appear to them. It does not mean that all will be saved because we know there's people that reject God. It does mean that if everyone would turn and repent and confess Jesus Christ, then everyone could be saved. If they would do that, everyone would be saved. Saved. The blood of Christ was enough for the entire world times a billion. Everyone's going to have that opportunity. And so right out of the gate, I don't see how you get that one messed up. 
Now flip over to John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 36. John chapter 3, John uh, records Jesus talking to Nicodemus throughout John chapter 3 and then some other things. John chapter 3 is a wonderful, wonderful chapter. If you want to go and get some salvation, turn to John chapter 3. Jesus explains it so, so clearly, so much. But here in John chapter 3, looking at verse 36, he says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. So there are two groups of people in this verse. There's those that are saved and those that are lost. There's those that are saved and those that are not saved. It says the ones that are not saved have the wrath of God abiding on them. The ones that are saved will have everlasting life. But if you notice and read that again, there is a key word. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Notice the key word, believeth. It's not the chosen. It's not the ones God picked. It's anyone, the whosoever. It's anyone that believeth or does not believe. It's free will. It's your choice. Clear as day. Now, I will admit that I don't understand why everybody doesn't believe. That just boggles my mind that Jesus Christ would die, that he would offer salvation to everyone, that you could choose to have eternal life in heaven with God or actually here on earth in the new city of Jerusalem uh, with Jesus. I don't see how you can have that offered and be so blind and stubborn to reject it. So I can see the theory behind them. That there's a John Calvin, if he did come up with it, is probably sitting around going, why doesn't everybody want to be saved? And he thought, well, maybe they can't be. And it turned into this big heresy. Yeah, I've seen people that were so mean and so ornery and so evil that you're like, gee, I don't know how God could save them. You know how God could save them? The same way He saved this sinner and that sinner over there and that sinner over there by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we can be saved. And so the Bible clearly speaks that belief is important. It is free will. Clearly. Now flip over to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, looking at verse 24. John chapter 5, looking at verse 24. says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Not clear in verse 24, he says, Anyone that believeth, it says, Here's my word, how do we believe? By hearing the word of God, and believeth on him that sent me, believing in God, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. Again, he says, Belief. Again, he's shown clearly that anyone who believes will have eternal life. It's not a flip of a coin. It's not a maybe. It's not by chance. There's not a select group of people. Some people try to say, well, well, some people have free will, and then there's others that... No, it's everyone has free will. Everyone has a choice. Everyone has an opportunity, and we need to do a better job of preaching that, that, hey, you do have a choice. You do have an opportunity, and you need to make that choice, Jesus Christ. You need to take that opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you need to find salvation now no more waiting it's for everyone if everyone would simply believe can you imagine worshiping and believing and following a god that you know handpicked who he wanted to save again i don't know why some people have more troubles than others i don't know why some people die younger than others i don't know why some people are richer than others but what i know is all have the opportunity to know jesus Christ as their Savior, and that one point means we serve the greatest God we could ever serve. We serve the greatest Savior that we could ever serve. Now, another thing about it, it's eternal, and flip over to John chapter 10, you know, you preach salvation for all, and, you know, maybe people are all, well, yeah, anyone can be saved, but maybe they lose it. No, it's eternal. No one can stop it. John chapter 10, look at verse 27. Jesus again says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I 
29, my father won. Now they'll try to take 29 and say, see, God gave them, God picked who he wanted. Now what Jesus is saying is, it was God's plan from the beginning that I would come and I would be their Savior, and so they were predestined to be allowed to accept Christ, but it doesn't say God chose them. It says he gave them to me, he chose me, he picked me, he's predestined from the front that I would be here to be the Savior, but he didn't force them to be. But you look back up above that in 28, it says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And lay this next part, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. No man, no evil, no demon, no government, no Satan, no nobody, not even ourselves, can stop us from being saved once our faith and trust is in Christ. And that's good because if you could lose your salvation, Satan's evil. Amen. Satan's mean. Demons are mean. Satan has a lot of people on this earth that are downright rotten and mean. If you could lose your salvation, Satan would have people like tying you up and beating you until you cussed. And oh, you lost your salvation, then they'd cut your head off. I mean, Satan's mean like that. God knew that. God made it where when we believe in Jesus, we're saved, and we're saved for eternity, no matter how bad we fail, no matter how bad we sin, we are still saved. Now, you can pull yourself from God fellowship-wise, and you can still be saved, but you're not living right, so you're not going to be that closeness, you're not going to have that good feeling, you're not going to have God's blessings, but no matter how far away we get from God, we can't lose that salvation. But another thing, the moment we repent of that and say, God, I'm sorry. God, please help me. God, I need you. It's just like Peter sinking in the water. says as soon as he looked away, he started sinking. It says immediately Jesus was there with his hand out. Immediately when we cry out to God, he is back and we're back in that great comfort. We were always saved, but we were kind of pulled away. We cried and we're immediately back there. But even on our worst day, on our darkest day, when you're doing the absolute worst thing you can imagine, you're still saved. We cannot lose that. Now flip back to Romans chapter 8, right where we were. And here's where context stuff really starts helping. Look at Romans chapter 8. It's where I'm being 35, though, this time. Romans chapter 8 and 35. Literally leading right up into where, right up to where we, or right after, you know, with Calvinists take Romans 8, 29, and 30 and mess them up. But look down here at 8 and 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at that list. Now he is talking to the Roman people, and we know Roman persecution. Romans like to crucify Christians. Romans like to impel Christians. Uh, but we see it up through the Dark Ages. We see through our Baptist history over 50 million of our brethren were killed for standing for the cause of Christ. Today, in Muslim countries, Christians are killed for standing for the cause of Christ, and it may be coming soon. So look at it again in 35. Paul says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? No. Distress? No. No. Persecution, no. Famine, no. Nakedness, no. Peril, no. Sword, no. And notice 36, it says, That is written, For the sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted for sheep for the slaughter. He's given us warning that we may face that. He says, But in this we're more than conquerors. Look at 38. I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present or things to come, height, depth, or any other creature can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul basically says, Nothing can separate us from Christ. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Man, that just bring joy to your heart, realizing that on my worst day, on my sickest day, if I'm being persecuted, if I'm rounded up and put in a concentration camp, if I'm gassed, if I'm whipped, if I'm beheaded, if I'm beaten, if my well, no matter what happens, no matter if it's persecution, tribulation, or trials, nothing can separate us from Jesus Christ. That's why on our darkest day, on our worst day, a child of God can still smile. Because Jesus is my Savior. That's what we have to focus on. When you're having the worst day of your life, 
it's something really bad, you've lost a loved one, uh, you may have lost a whole bunch of lives, whatever happens on our worst day, Jesus is still our Savior. And we can celebrate that. Now, now let's look at that a little bit. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 39. Hebrews 10 and 39. Notice what the author of Hebrews, which is probably Paul, says about people. And this is where people get, get confused too. Hebrews is written to save believers. It's not written to lost people. It's written to save believers of Jewish descent that wanted to go back into the law. Uh, so keep that in mind. Verse 39 of chapter 10 says, But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, if you believe this is written to lost people, then you think, well, they, they can just, you know, go back to being lost. He's talking about saved people who want to go back into the world, saved people who want to go back under the law. It doesn't stop their salvation, but he's saying we should not be like those people. We need to be moving forward. We need to be focused forward. And we need to be advancing forward. And we need to be those who believe to the saving of her soul. He said we're going to focus on faith. We're going to focus on grace. We're not going to focus on the law. We're not going to focus on going back into works. He says we're going to focus on the fact that we are saved and it's our belief. Notice there it says those that believe to the saving of the soul. Again, it's showing that belief is needed for salvation. It's not the chosen. It's not those who God predestined. It's those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, one more verse. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. You may be wondering why, why we're hammering this home. It's because, again, Calvinism has taken over a lot of Baptist churches. And I just don't understand that. Because the amazing thing about God is that you're a whosoever. His grace, His love, His mercy gives salvation to anyone who would believe. The dirtiest, rotten sinner can come to know Christ and find salvation. And that is absolutely beautiful, showing the love of God. And so let's look at 1 Peter 1 and 5, the fact that we're kept by the power of God. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 says, Who are kept by the... Well, let's back up to 4. Why not? Let, let's get a few more verses. Go back to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, amen, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And you see that we do have this incorrupt, incorruptible inheritance. But verse 5 says, kept by the power of God. Again, God is the one keeping our salvation. And in us it says, through faith, how are we saved? By grace, through faith, unto our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The fact that whether you die now or whatever, when Jesus comes back in the last time, we're all going to be eternal. We're going to get the glorified body. We're going to celebrate for Him. If we're in the grave, if we're coming back, if we're in heaven, we're coming back. If we're hanging out in this world, we're going to be lifted up. But in the end time, it's going to be revealed that we have that incorruptible inheritance because of the belief and faith in Jesus Christ. And so I think what's so personally aggravating about that heresy is that belief takes the love of God out of it. I mean, I guess if you're one of the chosen, God's love is great. But if you're one of the not chosen, then God stinks. Now somebody is going to take that quote and say that I said that. But you look at that, I mean, can you imagine that? God loved the world. I mean, John 3.16, I, I could have just read that and we could have went home, but where's the fun in that? John 3.16, for God so loved the chosen. No. For God so loved the best. No. For God so loved the world. How much clarity do you need? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him. There's that word again. Whosoever, anyone, believeth, there's your key word, in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's so clear. It's open to the world. It's open to the whosoevers. And it's by belief in Jesus Christ. Checkmate. And so the question, though, that we ought to be focused on, I guess, is do you know Christ as your Savior? 
The great thing is you should know by now that you have an opportunity. You don't have to wonder, am I chosen? Yes, Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. Jesus offers you salvation. The ball's in your court. Will you accept it? The Holy Spirit will move upon your heart and convict your heart and you will realize that I'm lost. And you're going to be sitting there and you're going to be in turmoil because I've been there, you've been there. The Holy Spirit's telling you, you're lost. You need Jesus. And you're going to be fighting. Why fight? We all had excuses. Oh, I'll wait till tomorrow. I'll wait till this. I'll wait till that. Do not wait. Especially now. We don't know what's going to come tomorrow. But you know what? None of us are promised tomorrow. Car wrecks kill every day. Accidents happen every day. People have been killed by meteorites falling from the sky and whacking them in the head like a one in a million chance. You know what? God knows the time of your death. And so you see that. And why wait? Why put it off? Why fight? Why do you think you have tomorrow? If the Holy Spirit's convicting you today, the best thing you can do is accept Christ as your Savior, and you'll find out why I'm screaming at you to do it. Because once you find Christ as your Savior, you'll realize how great salvation really is. You'll taste of that salvation. It's kind of like a... Well, I, I hate comparing salvation and stuff. We compare salvation to like a car and how nobody would turn down a free car, but people turn down salvation. I mean, tasting of that is kind of like this, this amazing sister darling. Where is she at? Back there. If you have not had her peach cobbler. Now, if I'm going to compare a salvation to a food, I'm going to compare it to her peach cobbler. If you have not had, somebody say amen. You know what I'm talking about. If you've had her peach cobbler, there's not a greater, sweeter, better food in the world. I'm sorry to everybody else that cooks, especially to my wife. I'm sorry to say that. But her peach cobbler is probably the greatest food in the world. But if you haven't tasted it, you don't know how sweet it is. If you haven't tasted it, you don't know that I'm telling the truth. It's like salvation. If you're not saved, you don't know what you're missing. You don't know how wonderful it is. And so if you're not saved, I would pray today, and I hope everyone's praying this prayer, that if you're not saved, that today you would come to know salvation. You would believe in your heart that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and that you would call upon His name as we read this morning, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever... Believe it's on him, right? For whose service you call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll believe in your heart that Jesus is the Savior, that God raised him from the dead, and simply call, Jesus, I need a Savior. Jesus, you're the Savior. Jesus, please save me. Just be honest and humble. Just be honest and ask. Find Christ as your Savior today, and you'll know why it was so important. Don't tarry, don't wait. So maybe you are saved. Today, if you are saved, are you living like it? Are you rejoicing? Are you standing for the truth? Today in the dark world, we need God's people to be lots of the world. Yes, Jesus is the light of the world, but just like the moon, we are to be reflecting that light to a dark world. We need to be taking a stand. We need men to stand up and be actually men standing up, leading their families in spiritual life, leading their families to Christ, leading their families to church. Men actually standing up and saying, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus completely. We need women who will follow that. We need children raised up in that. We need God's people to realize that we're God's people and start living like it. We have such a wonderful joy. We celebrate. We have a Savior that died for us when we were unlovable, that saved us when we were unworthy, that still loves us today even though we completely fail Him. We have a wonderful Savior that can save the whole world because salvation is open to all. We need to be living like it. We need to be proclaiming it. We need to be screaming it on the street corners and telling everyone that will listen that as the day gets worse, as the world gets worse, we don't care because we have our faith and our hope in Jesus Christ. 
So as the song leader comes today and the musicians come today, I pray that if you're here and you're lost, that you would take this opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I cannot fathom leaving here and facing the world without Christ. I would pray that you wouldn't do that. I would pray that you would take the time to accept Christ as your Savior today so you can leave this door, you can leave this room, you can face the world with the comfort of Christ, the hope of Christ, the strength of Christ, the guidance of Christ, the love of Christ, the salvation of Christ, and that's the only way you can face tomorrow. I pray that you would find Christ today. And then, child of God, as we stand, today is a wonderful day. It is the day. It is your opportunity to decide, today I'm going to be faithful. Today I'm going to take take a stand. Today I'm going to start following Christ. Today I'm going to live for Him. Today I'm going to decide to forsake my wants, my desires, my lust, and I'm going to put it all in Jesus' hands. I'm going to turn it all over to Him. I'm going to completely follow Him. For here on out for me to live is Christ. Maybe you need to make that commitment today, or maybe you've already done that and you simply want to pray, Jesus, thank you for my salvation. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Jesus, thank you for keeping me saved. Whatever your need, you can give it to Christ today as we 